Welcome to the Pain Gap Podcast. Join me as I engage with experts, patients, journalists, legislators, and policy experts. Together, we'll explore intersectional health disparities and advocate for accessible, equitable health care for women of all backgrounds. Let's ignite progress and demand urgent action for women's health worldwide. Ilana Jacqueline, I am so excited to have you on the Pain Gap podcast. I have been an avid follower of your work, especially on social media. And initially, I mean, not initially, usually I would, you know, uh, ask my guests about medical gaslighting from the perspective of me being the expert, but you really are the expert. Like you are someone I look to as someone who educates, advocates, but also um, raises awareness on medical gaslighting and also someone with a wealth of experience like yourself. So my first question to you really is, um, give us medical gaslighting 101 for people who have no idea what it is. Uh, What is it? Your experience with it? And of course, your book, your upcoming book. Thank you. Yes. And I, I just want to say same, same, same to you. I look to you as well. And yeah. Um, thank you. So medical gaslighting, it is it is the most insidious thing you don't realize has already happened to you. Uh, gaslighting, you know, is when someone tries to make you question your reality. And so by our definition in the book, medical gaslighting is when a healthcare provider responds to a patient's complaint or concern about their body by like waving away that concern, dismissing it, or or even shaming the patient for trying to investigate the cause or to seek treatment. And I promise you, you've seen it. Your viewers have seen it. It sounds like, oh, you're too young to be sick. You're too pretty to be sick. You're too thin to be sick. You're too fat to be sick. You're sick because you're old. You're sick because you worry too much. You know, it looks like talking you out of having tests that you want ordered, ordered. It looks like asking if you've seen a therapist for all these concerns that you have. It looks like staining your online medical record with a diagnosis like conversion disorder or functional neurological disorder or facetious disorder. And yeah, this is something we both have experience with for sure. My experience, it's funny because in the book, I I really wanted to give like a prime example of a scenario. But the reality for me personally has been that medical gaslighting has gone on my entire life um, from day one. So my road to a diagnosis was a long one. It was it was 19 years. I have a genetic disease, so it's something I was born with. But I had 19 years of it, of having doctors tell me and, and my mother that these recurrent infections that I was having were a product of me wanting to get out of school or, you know, just being attention seeking or having anxiety or depression or, you know, I was told maybe I wasn't taking my antibiotics correctly or that maybe I wasn't taking them at all for me to continue having infections the way that I was having them. And they gaslit my mother first and told her, you know, your child is just sickly. She's just a sickly kid, which is a real like cop out medically. And this kind of like shrug off of serious quality of life altering issues is a real red flag for me now. And even after my diagnosis, I still continue to have experiences with medical gaslighting. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you next, because even when you are aware of it, even though I've written a book on it, your book on it is coming out this year. When when is it? When's the release date again? October? October 1st, 2024. So fall. Yes. Note that down. But why... Why do you think medical gaslighting happens? I mean, this is what a lot of people ask me because they're like, is it you? Did you imagine it? Because a lot of times you get gaslit about your gaslighting experience. Yes. Uh, And, you know, I always say, because some people think that my book is like anti-doctor, anti-medicine. And it's not not at that at all. But why do you think doctors do it? Do they are they lazy? Are doctors lazy or do women just do not have any credibility when it comes to their health, their bodies? Wouldn't that be easy if that was the answer? Wouldn't it be easy to just be like, yeah, that's it. I would love to be like doctors wake up in the morning and are just like, I'm going to make somebody feel bad today. I'm going to make them feel powerless. Um, And it just sucks because I know doctors and I have good friends that are doctors and they're such nice people. 
Um, but no. So <laughs> there are a lot of reasons that medical gaslighting happens. And and it's a it's a it's it's just as complex um, as disease itself. But some of the reasons are that we have an overburdened medical system right now. And so doctors are not being able to spend the amount of time that they would like to assess patients. And they're f- trying to find ways, consciously or not, of getting patients to kind of stop seeking care um, because the system is overburdened, particularly right now. So it is kind of a thing for that. There's also a long, long history of gaslighting women, as you know, and as you've written about. And that is something that has not died with modern science. We are still fighting these ridiculous, you know, thousand year old myths about women's health. And it, they've gone gone kind of, you know, blaming women on women's health problems on, you know, Adam and Eve and Pandora's box and, you know, all this kind of literal mythology to religion. And then it goes into, you know, the womb being the center of the universe for women. And just so many reasons that are just kind of trash, like they're just not based on any logical medical research and yeah, then of course many of them have been uh debunked but you're completely right that the legacy of hysteria still very much affects how and when and if women get a diagnosis to this day to yes this day. um you mentioned that you were gaslit and your mother was gaslit talk to mm-hmm. me a little bit more about that and also about how important it is to have that advocate on your side because it's so great that you had your mother but sometimes people don't, but it's so important to have that person on your corner. So if you could talk more about that. Yes. And it's something I actually talk about at length in the book too, is I kind of refer to it as like generational medical gaslighting. Um, you know, we, we it is something that's kind of passed down because when our, our mothers are taught about their bodies, that's what they teach us. And so if they're taught this pain is normal, then they're telling us that the pain is normal. Um, but my mother... Um, my mother was an excellent advocate for me as a child. This woman moved heaven and earth and she really did. I mean, she, she saw me having all these issues. She brought me to different specialists. She spoke up for me, but she just faced a lot of adversity in that. She faced a lot of doctors who were just like weird. It's not, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. I'm not going to do any other tests for it, but she really just was kind of dismissed and dismissed and dismissed. And by the time that I was, you know, a young teenager, she was like, listen, I know that you're really sick. You know that you're really sick. You're going to have to fight for yourself in every exam room and really sat me down and had a lot of frank conversations with me about how to get the care that I needed. And we did eventually uh, get my diagnosis when I was 19 and I was still living at home because I was so sick and I was... I was 19, so I was still living at home. Um, but my mother really um, was a huge part of that. And and not just in teaching me to be resilient about it, about fighting back, but also just in, in encouraging me. And we did find the diagnosis. And that was, you know, that was great. That was wonderful. But it certainly was not the end of the road. So a lot of the lessons that she's kind of imparted on me, I've I've continued to impart on others. So I definitely look up to her look up to her for that. And she's had a lot of her own health struggles that she's been able to figure out. And you're right, though, that not everyone has that. Not everyone has someone in their court. And so when you're being gaslit, not just by your doctors, but by your own family, another huge issue I tackle in this book, that can be really debilitating on your journey to a diagnosis or correct treatment. Because just like you said in the beginning, we gaslight ourselves. And when we hear that as an echo from the people around us and the people who love us, yeah, it certainly does make things worse and harder. Exactly. You make such an important point that, you know, you were gaslit, you got a diagnosis, but your journey didn't end there. A lot of people, they get ends with the diagnosis. No so way. Talk to us, yeah, no way. So talk to us more about your story, because some people are like, oh, you're so lucky you got a diagnosis. Uh, no, it, it's not over there. Yeah. Um, in weird ways, I do feel lucky, though. I do feel like getting that diagnosis was, oh, man, I felt so vindicated after so long of just, you know, seeing a blood test that was like confirming, oh, something is way off here. Um, but yes, medical gaslighting, it's its not going to stop just when you're diagnosed. I was diagnosed. It took me 10 years 
after my diagnosis to get a doctor who understood enough about my disease and who believed me enough in my narrative of what was going on in my body to put me on a treatment plan that was starting to work. And what happened in the time that I went undiagnosed and in the time that I went untreated with this disease was I faced a lot of organ damage and a lot of comorbidities as anyone does when they have, uh, you know, an illness that goes untreated, which is what happens to all of these women um, who are medically gaslit is the disease progresses, major consequence, and they miss precious time to, you know, stop cancer spreading, stop infection spreading, stop organ damage. So personally for me, I started dealing with um, a lot of multi-system issues. So I had dysautonomia, which is the dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. That was kind of the first failure. And then I had migraines that started in my early 20s. Um, I had gastrointestinal issues. It was really every system that had had an infection ended up just spiraling. And the migraines were something that were really difficult for me because I relied so heavily on my brain to get me through everything. <laughs> you know, when you're when you're gaslit like that's your best tool. It's it's, you know. So, um one really major thing that's that happened to me recently is that a couple of years ago, around the start of the pandemic, I started getting left-sided weakness in my body, completely left-sided weakness and having these terrible migraines that were intractable. There was no migraine medication that was working for them. And I was, I was having memory loss, stuttering. It became, it was so scary. It was so severe. So my parents and my husband put me in the back of the car, drove me up to the nearest tertiary care center and got me in with their neurology unit. And that experience was so bizarre because when you are gravely ill, everyone tells you, oh, go to X, Y, Z. You know what I'm talking about. Go to the, the best care in the United States they'll be able to figure it out. So I went to this center and I was evaluated. And the doctor at the end of all my evaluations was like, I think you have conversion disorder, which is really a nice way of saying you're faking it. It's psychosomatic. It's not really happening. There's nothing medically wrong with you in that aspect. And I was furious. I left that place furious, severely ill. And for the next year or two, I really struggled to get any care because I had this label on my medical record that said conversion disorders. And as soon as doctors see that, it is a red flag for them. They're like, you're done. This is all in your head. I'm not doing anything. It took me a year to get an MRI, an MRV of my brain. And I got it at an emergency room where I had to wait 15 hours to, to be seen by a doctor. And I was finally able to get this MRI, an MRV. And what it showed was that I had very severe intracranial hypertension, which is when spinal fluid backs up into your skull and crushes your brain against your skull. It is extremely painful. It damages your optic nerve. So I had actually, I've lost peripheral vision in my right eye permanently, and I almost went blind. And the symptoms of this also relate to the ones that I was having when I went to that tertiary care center. So that doctor gaslighting me, telling me, oh, nothing's wrong. It's not a big deal putting that label on me. And I also, I, there were months after that where I did not want to see care. Like I did not want to be gaslit again. So I stopped myself from going to doctors and getting this figured out sooner and ended up having permanent damage. And so this is this is happening to to women all over the country with all different kinds of conditions. Um, but that's just a continuation, even after all these years, even after getting this diagnosis, even after being a professional patient advocate, I still had this problem. Wow, a professional patient advocate. I mean, truly, but I'm so glad you say that because women don't realize that they're not alone, even now, even though so many women are speaking up uh, and speaking out finally, like for so long, I thought what happened to me with my birth trauma only happened to me. And even though now, like, especially like because of my book, I get to meet so many incredible women just like just like you and we share our stories. But it's like it's still it just because you become an advocate or even an expert or a specialist, it doesn't mean that your days of dealing with it are over. There's no insurance against medical gaslighting, which is why it's so important to advocate for it. And I, you hit another really important point, which is people don't understand how deadly it is that oh, women yeah. are being dismissed to death. 
I mean, uh, I think people just think that women are whining about uh, not being believed by the doctor, but they don't realize it's an endemic, systemic, and it's deadly. So talk to me about that. Yeah, the consequences of medical gaslighting go far and beyond just feeling a little embarrassed, which is really what people think it is. They're like, oh, it's, oh, she's a little embarrassed. I almost lost my vision. Like, no, it's way worse than that. And in the book, I really wanted to kind of explore what are the consequences? Like, what is really happening here? And um, shame is the first one. And that's really, when you say that, you know, you didn't know there were other women, that's because you were shamed and you were secluded in that shame. And that that is the goal of medical guests. I mean, they want you secluded in that so you do not seek care and you don't, you don't, you don't do exactly what you and I are doing, which is encouraging other women to seek care. So, ha ha. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's one of the consequences. Shame, death, absolutely death is a consequence. There are women who have cancers that, uh, you know, th they're constantly seeking care, trying, being told, hey, no, this is not, you, you're fine. Don't worry about it. And then it's too late. There are women who have lost organs, who have lost extremities. Um, stories of that in the book were absolutely insane. And then uh, the other consequences. There's so many of them and there, there are so many really horrendous things that are happening to women. But really the biggest issue is that the consequence is that we don't seek care after we've been humiliated in an exam room. And anything can happen after that. We're just yeah. leaving it up to chance. It's like having PTSD or you're traumatized from your last doctor's visit. I completely, completely understand that. Uh, and it makes so much sense because women, uh, it's so easy to make women feel like that. So easy. Oh, to, yeah. And it's so easy to silence women. I mean, even a woman like me, do I look like I could ever be silenced? The <laughs> same, <I> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you, how did you start your research for your book, which I'm so excited to get my hands on? Um, how did you start? Because when I started with my book, I just, um, I well, I you know, we got the contract, you know, it's like a whole process. And I started with women's stories. And it was mm -hmm. very quickly that I realized that every woman really has a doctor story. Every woman has a medical gaslighting story. Where did you start with your research for your book? So that's a great question. It really started very organically. I've been working in advocacy for almost 15 years now and I actually started in the rare disease space, which is just absolutely overpopulated with medical gaslighting stories because these are patient zeros, a lot of them. So the disease is not known. It's not heard of. There's a lot of parents that go through medical gaslighting. Um, Almost everyone who has a rare disease has been told in the first exam, no, you're making this, this can't be real. You never see this, so it doesn't exist. So I heard a lot of stories um, early on in my career. I worked for Global Genes, which is a rare and genetic disease organization. And my job was literally just like intaking patient stories. So I heard thousands of them. And then throughout my career, I started hearing them in other spaces. Um, right now, I work more in general chronic illness, so autoimmune, immune deficiencies, women's health diseases. And it was the same story there. It was just if you were a woman with a disease in general, you were going to have it. So when it came to working on this book, I, I had already had so many stories shared with me that I was just kind of heavily carrying around. And I was looking for a place to put them. And I do a lot of advocacy on TikTok. I do a lot of advocacy on Instagram. And I noticed that the videos that I would do that specifically talked about medical gaslighting and how to fight back were my most popular videos by far. And I had one video that ended up getting, I think it was like 6 million views. And the comment sections, thousands of comments that were just women and their and their stories about when they were medically gaslit. There was never the question asked in the video. Women were fully volunteering this. And I realized I know that I can find I know that I can find women to do this, to to tell me their story. But I also just wanted to dig deeper. I wanted to talk to doctors themselves. I wanted to talk to specifically pain management doctors. I wanted to talk to medical students to learn what is being taught that this is happening so much to every woman. And you're women, these women medical students, like what is happening here? I wanted to talk to the NIH to see what they were doing about this. I wanted to look at the women who were dealing with the aftermath of 
the opioid epidemic and the CDC guidelines that were released in 2006 and then again four years later, which works wildly different. So there was so much that was all right in front of me and I was just looking for a place to put it. So so eventually I, I reached out to my my literary agent. We talked about it. I think I had the proposal done within a week and then wow. and then we were looking at at deals with different publishers um and just two or three weeks after that it all happened very very fast this I, p- people were hungry for this publishers yes. continue to be hungry for books that you know go over this topic it's we're waiting for the whole shelf to be filled at the bookstore oh i love that i love that metaphor and you're completely right and by the way writing a proposal in a week like who are you we need to do another episode <laughs> with you just about that <laughs> proposal <laughs> writing 101 in a week what <laughs> been years, uh, as I'm sure you know. Um, It's so great that we have the word now, medical gaslighting. Yes. And and it's so great that we have so much language now that we just, you know, I think especially in you and I in our lifetime, you know, I mean, uh, my daughter is so lucky that she's just growing up with, I mean, so many different kinds of gaslighting. You have Trump doing it. You have the doctor doing it. (laughs) Yeah. Talk to me about how, I mean, this is why women... Do you think this is why women were not coming forward, not only because we were socially conditioned not to, you know, shamed into being silenced, but we didn't have the language to call the it language. Out. It's a huge thing. It's such a huge thing. And I do touch on that in the book, too. Like, it's really, you know, the definition, like defining it and having those words matter so much. It really it's the doorway. You know, I, I just I kind of talk about the idea of like, you know, being feeling like, oh, I didn't want to do that with him. Oh, that was rape. You know, like that's having the words is so powerful. And for me growing up, I grew up with a chronic illness, not knowing the words chronic illness, never putting those two together until I was in college, until I had a friend who was like, oh, I have a chronic illness too. And I was like, a what? I like, I just hadn't put myself in that category I didn't fully understand all that came with it and having that friend open that door for me and just being like, you have a chronic illness. Like that's what you're, that's everything that you're talking about. That meant support groups that meant, you know, books, advice, like just so many things came to me when I realized what that was. And yes, I think women all experience medical gaslighting, but they just haven't, they've pushed it into a nothingness because there wasn't words. They they kind of dismissed it themselves because there was they, they couldn't say, oh, I was medically gaslit in that appointment. But they're going to have that. They're going to have that definition now. And it is going to make a huge difference. It's going to be much harder to get away with gaslighting patients when they have the words. Yes. Yes. I love that. Um, I wanted to ask you, your advocacy on social media is so great. It's so great. It's so engaging. It's how I found you. It's how I fell in love with you. (laughs) But your work is so great and so important because you want to make it interesting and captivating. Tell me, like, how did you wake up one day and decide, I'm going to take my message online? Are you strategic about it? Or are you just like, I just found this out and people need to know? Oh, no, I'm crazy strategic about it. I will will sit down and have a conversation for like four hours about all the different like mazes of of um, of social media and advocacy and um gosh it's i mean personally i started blogging i was one of, i was the 2010s blogger um involved in all those network yeah you know and it's um i love that like i had a blog called let's feel better and it was just about you know a 20 something navigating life with chronic illness and it did really well it was really cathartic for me I loved it. It was like journaling openly. I got connected with so many people. It was just a great experience. And then came like real social media. And I, you know, I dabbled, but I didn't quite dive in until it started becoming part of my actual day job. So I've worked, uh, I've worked in advocacy. I mentioned I worked at Global Genes. I've worked at different biotech companies. I've consulted for different pharmaceutical companies. And um, and I work currently for a pharmaceutical digital marketing agency. And I have been so privileged to have part of my work there be exploring different social media platforms and truly understanding the patient voice in them. 
And so when it came to TikTok, as soon as it really started to blow up in early 2020, I was like, I, I'm going to take this and I'm just, I'm going to run. I'm going to run with this. And I just fell in love with the ease of the platform, the comedy, the way that patients were storytelling, the way that people were storytelling, the dark humor. And I was like, oh, I could totally vibe with this. And in the beginning, it's a lot of, you know, teen girls dancing. It's a lot of weird sound clips. You're just kind of voicing over and associating with whatever your message is. And there was a lot of that. I did do a lot of exploring. It wasn't until, honestly, maybe like, two years ago that I really started doing original content where I started producing content that was like, I'm writing scripts, I'm wearing different character outfits, I'm playing, I'm putting together a one woman show. And at the time felt so, I felt so silly, but I pushed through the feeling of silliness because I am not afraid of my shame. And I just pushed through the silliness of it. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing something here. People are watching, people are learning. This is not just entertainment, this is advocacy and I really fell in love with the storytelling aspect of it and of the the immediate response, the community, just the opportunity to be so creative and and limitless on there. And even now, part of my I do a lot of consulting with different um, uh, disease advocacy foundations, different companies, and just talking to them about you know, explain that these platforms are they're so popular for a reason, and that any message you're trying to convey, can be converted to this platform. Like you can do it. You have to get over your fear of looking silly. And uh and you know having having somebody who knows the platform well definitely helps. Look to your, you know, your interns and your your younger employees because they tend to get that humor a little bit better, but it's it's so worth investing time and energy in because it really does pay off and it certainly has for me. Yeah. That is, that is such an important message. I think people don't realize it's okay to look silly. Nobody thinks, I mean, I, I saw a really great quote actually on Instagram that says, don't worry about looking silly. Um, the people who care, the people who matter don't care and the people who care don't matter. And it's so true. It's like, we're all figuring it out. Um, and when you're on those platforms, really the best way to learn it is to play with it. You have to play with it. Yes. Just, the, just like a new toy. Um, I love that you say that you have a strategy, you were strategic about it, because I think a lot yes. of people also think that you're just supposed to wake up one day and post a video and it'll get like a million views and it'll go viral, or they're just like waiting for that video to go viral, which I think that if you try too hard, it's not gonna go no. viral. So I love that you have a strategy about it because I think that's so smart and more people should A, have one and B, uh, be open about the fact that they do. Uh, how long on average would you say you spend on one of your videos or how much do you think is good to like release a week? Like what is kind of your like top tips? Because you, she, ladies and gentlemen, Ilana, you have <laughs> to check her out on TikTok and Instagram if you don't already, because she is a mega star. She's like, I mean, her videos are, they're all viral. So yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, okay. So here's the thing for me. The thing for me is that I don't have a lot of energy. I don't have a lot of energy and filming can take a lot out of you. Uh, so what I usually do, like my usual strategy for the week for me as a one woman show is at the beginning of the week, I'm going to start writing out scripts. I think about the topics that I want to communicate, like overall, what message do I want to communicate? And then I sit down and I, I write a script. I work on, I, I scroll, I look at different trends. I look how people are, you know, popular topics, what people are talking about. I look on there to get inspiration. What are patients experiencing? How can I respond with advice that makes sense for them? And then I choose one day of the week and that's my filming day. I get up early, I put on full glam makeup and I have a green screen that I got off of Amazon. Um, there's no professional equipment in my house that's like real photography stuff. I use my phone, I use a ring light, I use a green screen. And I bought a bunch of different outfits and um, and I just I play out my roles and I try to film. I usually play a doctor. So I have like a doctor coat and stethoscope and I might have five or six different skits that have the doctor in it. So I will write out all of the lines for the doctor, stay in that one outfit, film everything in front of a green screen, switch to the next character. And I usually can get several videos done in a day and really only be filming for like an hour and a half, maybe two hours. 
And then comes the actual hard part. I know we talked about this before is the editing. The editing can be brutal. If you're not familiar with it, it does take time to learn. And there are some amazing apps out there, but you have to be a little curious. You have to watch some YouTube tutorials. You have to think about things like accessibility. Um, you always want to have captions, especially if you're if you're doing patient advocacy. You always want to have great captions. So, I, you know, it took a while to learn. I, I've definitely made some videos that were flops, um, but but it, I I really I have a lot of fun with it either way. Um, and I think you you study the videos as well. You kind of look at like what screen cap made the best cover that got the most people engaged. And I look at my analytics, like who is my audience? Um, am I attracting the right people that I want to attract? Which is like, it's like 95% women. So I'm I'm right where I want to be. Yeah. Um, and I look at little things, like people tend to comment on my earrings. So I always wear really funny, cute earrings if I can. <laughs> That's awesome. No, but it's true because you start engaging with, and this community it builds, it happens really organically. And it's you know what? At, at, for all the filth that can be on the internet, there are some oh, yeah. of those still famous <laughs> last ones for me. Um, I want to talk to you about medical biases, women, and pain, which is an issue I'm obsessed with. Uh, but there's so many studies now that back what women have said for, I think, years, centuries. So talk to me about medical biases, women, and pain, because we know it exists. We know it persists. Uh, what do you want people to know about those things? That it's still happening and it it can be very, very dangerous, both physically and mentally. Um, I do talk about this a lot in the book, kind of just the experience of pain management in general. We really have been, you know, I talked about like generational medical gaslighting earlier, but we really do gather what is the acceptable amount of pain from our mothers and our aunts and our, our older sisters. And we carry that with us into doctor's offices. So when they ask, hey, how is your pain? We tend to be a little misguided on the idea that having a lot of pain, moderate pain, severe pain is pretty normal um, when it's not, when there are resolutions to that. But of course, if you're a woman and you're seeking pain management, you're going to come up against, you're going to come up against it in general. You're going to come up against bias. You're going to come up against just a uh, a lack of a desire to take care of your symptoms. And that's because doctors are really in, they're in a hard place right now with what happened with the opioid epidemic. They are dealing with a lot of crackdowns from the CDC and from local government agencies that are very concerned about overprescribing. But I talk about in the book how we should be concerned about overprescribing, but also underprescribing, which is happening to a lot of women. I'm talking about, you know, the fact that that we are still going into gynecologist offices and being Getting given IUDs. Up. With yep. that accurate. I went with, I went with a friend the other day to go get her IUD put in and she to advocate for her, right? To advocate for her. And, you know, she was given, I think she was given like a Xanax or something to help her relax, but not pain management. Not for the pain, yeah. Not oh, for the pain. And, and this poor girl went white as a sheet on the table. Um, and I knew what was coming. and I knew she didn't know. Yeah. And I was like, Ooh. Oh, um, yes. but, but yeah, that, that is, that's the thing that we're still having to advocate for, you know, women going in and having cystoscopies or, you know, so many procedures that are like barbaric and I, I hate to say that it really like that, but like word, they, though. that is the word. Yeah. So many women have used that word in describing some of their experiences, even even to me. But the other thing that's really interesting is that there's studies that show that women are something like 20% more likely to get, no, it's sorry, that statistic isn't right, but women are more likely uh, to be diagnosed for their pain conditions as a psychological uh, Absolutely. disorder. A, mm -hmm. a medical condition to this day. I mean, they have studies that show that women uh, wait longer than men in the emergency room to be seen. Um, that they have, if men have lower to, uh, lower instances of pain, it's still taken so seriously. We take men's suffering so seriously, and we have such a high tolerance for women's pain in in every culture in the world. I find mm -hmm. it. Fascinating. I find it fascinating that it happens as frequently as it does in America. I really do. It's wild. And I, I want to tell you about something 
that I've been looking at lately, which is like, it is insidious, but um, it goes back to these tertiary care centers. Um, they're opening what they're calling these pain rehab programs. And they're targeting teenage girls with conditions like Ehlers-Danlos, long-haul COVID, CRPS, endometriosis. And these programs are like advertised as centers to reduce and improve pain. They're saying that they're going to teach pain management coping techniques, but that is not what is happening to these girls. And they're speaking out. These girls are being tortured and they're being taught to hide their pain, not how to fix it, not how to cope with it, how to stop behaviors that acknowledge the existence of that pain. They're teaching them to stop complaining. And, and that doing so is an ugly behavior that only makes the pain worse. And they gaslight these women, these teenagers, so violently that, I mean, there really are stories coming out. I have one in the book, um, but about the medical trauma inflicted here that is designed to stop women from seeking care, you know, to shame them into feeling guilty, ugly in their pain. Um, you know, reinforcing the idea that disability is a really unlovable trait and that you know, instead of continuing to research these conditions, which primarily impact women, it's easier, it's more convenient, it's more cost effective to dismiss reality and hope women will just fall in line with eons of similar treatment and continue to stay silent. But they're not. They're speaking out. That And that is so, well, first of all, take me to church, Alana. Snap, <laughs> snap all around. And th which takes us to our next important uh, point. Yes, they're speaking out. Talk to me about how this generation, the next generation of women, even more than our generation of women, are oh, yeah. not. I mean, they're even breaking all the silence around menopause and perimenopause. So that gives me a lot of hope on days when we can feel really down, especially in the line of work that you and I are in. So talk okay. to me about these young women. How, what what memo did they get that we did not get? <laughs> oh, they're so over it. I'm so, I'm so thrilled for them. They're like not taking anyone's crap. They are speaking out. I love it. I love seeing people, women go online, go on their social media and just pop off. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, and, you know, they are seeing other... They've had something that we didn't quite have growing up. They have visibility into other women's lives and other women's experiences that we just didn't have access to that we have now. It's wonderful, but they absolutely did not have it. And I think that it is so empowering for them to have these platforms where they get to see, oh, this is not just happening to me. And if this does happen to me, I know exactly what this is. So I'm really excited to, to see what becomes of this next generation of women. I just know that they are going to give such a absolutely not attitude to not having pain management, to not having their their symptoms believed. They're going to have more information, more backup than ever before. It's going to be really hard to ignore women with these with these girls growing up. Yay! You just lit a fire in me. I mean, I have two. I have a twelve year old and a six year old, and yeah, on my down days, I'm like, well, I know. <laughs> oh yeah they will be putting up with this you know i always talk about the story but after everything that happened to me you know i was in labor for 33 hours you know i pushed for three uh when i was finally rolled in for my emergency c-section the doctor who was going to perform the surgery who i'd never seen before didn't believe that i was in pain yeah and he wanted me to you know get up from the stretcher uh from the whatever, yeah, the stretcher onto the operating table uh, on my own. And by that, at that time, I had a baby stuck between my legs. I've been, I'm like shaking from this fever. Um, they thought my epidural was hooked up and uh, it wasn't, but it gives me so much, um, so much kind of, I don't know, Release. energy and power just to know <laughs> that, you know, my, my youngest would have like been like, hey, you are an absolute angle and I'm going to sue the heck out of you. <laughs> but yeah. uh, before we end, there's two more questions. I could talk to you forever, first of all. We have to have Same. Yes. Uh, back on. And I'm so excited because this podcast is going to be all about uh, women's health, which I can talk about forever. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, this election year, I mean, oh my goodness, women's health is on the ballot. Women's health is front and center. What do you think is the most important women's health issue? Oof, 
I it's, mean, I think the big, the biggest one on the ballot, of course, I mean, the biggest issue is access to abortion and, and birth control. And I, I just, I say that in the sense of personally, I, I had dinner with one of my friends last night. We're sitting on the couch. We heard that there was, um, uh, you know, the VP posted that there was like a, a memo release that they were looking at banning abortion in all 50 states, uh, you know, all, all the states. And, um, and we looked at each other and I'm like, we can have a hysterectomy party. You and I could just like sit on the couch and we could just recover from our hysterectomies together. Yeah. And it's like, that is the handmaid's tale reality situation. Like we're all looking at just like bewildered. And it's, you know, I think it's, we're going to end up completely ruining the IVF industry, um, which is so needed, especially by women right now. Like, are you kidding? What incentive is there to have children right now? Um, of course they're waiting. Of course they're freezing their eggs. Of course they're going to get pregnant and they're like, at least in their forties, like who could afford to have a child right now? Um, oh. you know, so, so I think having the, the, the choice and the financial, I think the financial stability that women need to have a child they don't have right now. So if you take yeah. away access to IVF and you take away access to um, to abortion when it's needed in a medical necessity, what like what is the incentive for us to have children? You're gonna have that's gonna cause a lot of problems. It's just gonna <laughs> cause a lot of women to needlessly die in needless preventable deaths that are already happening. Because as I always like to say, women have always been getting abortions. It's about women being able to Obviously. get yes. safe abortions, right? Um, Ilana, thank you so much. This was so this was as awesome as I knew it was gonna be. And I I mean, you're definitely gonna I be had such a great time. Out. It was so <laughs> great and fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks this was great. So Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.